Well, the next job of this next civilization is not to build railroads or skyscrapers or highways or housing. It's to build the global digital jail and it has to be coded. And so right now our entire education system is being harnessed into coding the, this global virtual reality prison, but it's being sold to us as something progressive and innovative and that we have to be sure to, you know, close the digital divide or else some people might not be captured in the digital jail. I mean, they're not going to tell you that part. All right, Allison. Hello and welcome, independent researchers, skeptics and all of humankind, the shadow citizen. Shadow citizen will explore the shadows of an alternate reality. Your host, Rachel L. McIntosh. We are back once again with... Allison McDowell from Wrench in the Gears. And we had a great conversation last show and she blew my mind. We were talking about ed the education system, human capital bonds. If you haven't watched that, I recommend you go back, watch that. But today we're gonna focus on a little closer to home for me, Rhode Island, which seems to be the epicenter of all things AI. And um, so we're gonna talk to Allison. Allison, welcome to the show again. Allison, thank you so much. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, we didn't get into a lot of details with Rhode Island before. So do you want me to see if I can share my uh, the oh, screen yes, with please. the map? Okay, so this is, a, a I, I mentioned in the last show that I make maps. And this is a software that I intermittently use called Little Sis. And it's relationship mapping software and it's all crowdsourced. So you, you enter information and that each of these dots and lines opens up to a database record behind. And so this is a map that I made of Rhode Island. Oh gosh, it was back in November. So in August, I was watching a webinar about the pandemic that was between <laughs> Here, I'll we'll zoom in here. It was, it was about the pandemic and it was linked to Israel. So Israel, the Israeli health department is playing a role, has, has been playing a role in the COVID reopen program. And so this was an hour long webinar and I encourage people, we can maybe include the link in the comments if you wanna go, go to this map and interact with it directly. But it, the, the, even within this hour webinar that was again, connecting state officials in Rhode Island, uh, Liz Tanner was the representative there with a variety of individuals in Israel. They were talking about e-government and the shift towards sort of digital citizenship. And Israel is one of 10 digital nations. And a lot of it is based on pilots that were rolled out in Estonia. So if you look up Estonia, the New Yorker actually has a really long feature profile on Estonia as the blockchain country. So they're, they're integrating their social welfare programs into blockchain. And you can actually become an e-resident an e of Estonia, like a virtual resident of Estonia. They have a, a resident permitting process where you can pay taxes and incorporate your businesses in Estonia. And Tim Draper, who is part of that program in Estonia, has sort of theorized that soon we won't even need actual physical nations anymore. We'll just be belong to digital nations. So it seemed like in this webinar, again, that is the digital and Rhode Island digital government during pandemic webinar, where they were pitching telehealth, educational technology, something called a digital rights engine that you would have access to your rights sort of through a digital identity system. 
in Israel, that that was all being pitched to Rhode Island. And the Rhode Island Israel Collaborative was, was part of that program. So it seems to me in some respects that Rhode Island is being sort of groomed as the Estonia of the United States. And the United okay. States is not in this first wave of digital nations. It also includes Canada, Australia, the United Kingdom, Israel, South Korea, but a number of the Commonwealth countries where lockdowns have been really, really intense are also ones that are part of the digital nation program. And in this webinar, Liz Tanner, who, uh, let's see, she's with, I think the, the, the business director of business regulation in the state of Rhode Island, she was talking about developing a blockchain technology RFP for the state. And again, the idea that your government could be exist on blockchain and that your interactions with your government would be recorded on blockchain, that you might have a blockchain wallet that would entitle you to access your education benefits, your health system benefits, food assistance, all of these, these sorts of things. And so that relationship between Israel and Rhode Island is important because of the connection to the COVID reopen, uh, because Gina Raimondo had been cultivating last fall of 2019 in Israel, directly courting tech companies in Israel to come to the innovation hub that was being built in Rhode Island to, to come. And these many of these companies, I will say, we're talking transnational global capital. So they're not really US companies or Israeli companies. These companies were Dell, IBM, Oracle. Who do they belong to at this point? The, they were courting companies that had um, a presence along a large footprint in Israel to come back and, and set up business also in Rhode Island. So th this is sort of the backdrop to, to what is happening is this business development. Now, of course, our, our governor, her husband uh, works at one of these Israeli companies that is now incorporated in Rhode Island. Oh, interesting. Well, he was very active in the educational technology yes, space, he was. McKinsey, right? So that was that was his role. And so we'll just go over to, to, to Gina. Uh, do you say Raimondo or Raimondo? Raimondo. 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 So Gina Raimondo. So her background, I was looking into her background. Oh, good. And so she she's, you know, these the, these movers and shakers in this space they're often Ivy League credentialed, right? Yep. So, you know, Harvard, um, Oxford, Rhodes Scholar, Yale Law, you know, all of the sort of Ivy League deep state processes. And, you know, she, she did law clerking, but her background was actually in venture capital and social impact venture capital. So Village Ventures and Port Judith um, Capital. And then when she was in the, the treasurer, former treasurer of Rhode Island, she was running the retirement account. Mm -hmm. So when you talk about, are we investing, are our governments investing in these pay for success programs? My guess is that, yes, that the pension funds, both of the public service employees, I mean, ultimately will be the teacher pension funds as well. It may be the funds that are being put into college savings accounts. Some states have you prepay into a college savings account in the state system. Those funds are invested. And so those are very likely going to be teed up for investing in these pay for success markets. So you're, you're actually paying taxes and paying into your pension into a system that is going to digitally imprison you is, is the, the, the end game of that. But her role as both venture capital, her background in Ivy League venture capital, and then the treasury department is, is really important. So she is a founding member of something called Skillful. So skillful, when we talk about lifelong learning, when we talk about digital badging, skillful is a key operator in this space. And they're part of the Markle Foundation, which is this future of work. And again, the Markle Foundation and the future of work, they're very tied into cybersecurity. And their future of work is that really the robots are doing most of the work. Or when, you know, the the back in the day, maybe 10 years ago, where you would you you know, a company would get bought out and you would train your replacement who was someone in another country who was paid a much lower wage and you are expected to train your replacement, right? Well, our replacements are going to be the robots, right? So we're in this middle zone where they're imagining the future of work is predominantly done by robots. But in the meantime, we have to train the robots to do our jobs so that we can become digital commodities in relation to our government. So Skillful is one of the, the entities that is pursuing that. And let, let me just see if I click if this will open. 
Okay, so you can see these are, so it's skill, skill based workforce training. A lot of this is aligned to something called the Swiss model apprenticeship program. And when people hear it, like people like Switzerland, right? You know, like to imagine Are you kidding me? Yeah. snowy peaks and chocolate and pastries and right. They're not thinking about it's the United Nations. It's about um, hidden banking and hidden assets. It's about CERN and technology. Yes. It's about all of the, right. That, like when you say Swiss apprenticeship, you're like, oh, great. I could be a pastry chef. You know, yes. that, that's what people are thinking. They're not thinking Zug, the crypto valley of blockchain. And, and, and sort of these other dark forces at work, they're totally not. So the branding, this is sort of the Swiss apprenticeship model and Colorado is, is in the lead on that. But if you, if you look to see who, who's along with Gina, you've, you, and this is a few years ago, so I've added this record. Um, uh, you know, th th this program started in 2018. So these were the 2018 people, but, you know, and a lot of them are, uh, Democrats too, not exclusively, but you know, you, you have Jay Inslee, who was Washington state, again, major lockdown state. You, you've got, you know, Virginia, Vermont, Utah, Utah is a center of all the ed tech, state of Tennessee, big social impact, building brains, technology center, uh, South Dakota, Rhode Island, Oklahoma, the Kaiser foundation is all in Oklahoma, Ohio, uh, North Dakota, which I said is being remade, uh, you know, many states, these are a lot. And, and then Hickenlooper, in, in Colorado, he was part of this program. So you need to understand that skillful is connected to this network of reskilling and that the reskilling is now being triggered by the lockdowns. Mm -hmm. okay. And that, that, that what is going to happen, even though we're talking about K-12 education, that this lifelong learning program is that you're going to continue to have to chase the next badges. And in doing that, you will be financing this next skill badge acquisition through something likely called an income sharing agreement, which is up here. And the income sharing agreement is a contract that you go into that you um, agree that someone invests in your training and then they can garnish your wages for a certain amount of time once you get a job. Oh, and these income sharing agreements were piloted at Purdue University called Backing a Boiler and through their online education, globalized education program called Purdue Global. And that that this is this is a model that's going out. Initially, it was pitched as for your college, but I think it's going to be focused on coding boot camps. In, in, there are career impact bonds in place now in New Jersey with Phil Murphy, who's former Goldman Sachs. So, you know, they're all going to be investing in this to reskill people put out of work by the lockdowns into uh, coding, smart energy, and big pharma. So you can, you can, you can be thrown out of the, your meaningful work and have to do work that impact investors allow you to do. And I'm pretty sure that there will be no income sharing agreements for novelists or actors or art historians or any of the humanities. It's just going to be STEM, STEM, STEM. If you're not building the global digital jail or transhumanism, you're not going to get an income sharing agreement. And they're going to track you and that will be tracked on blockchain. And there's, there's a video I encourage people to watch. It's called Learning is Earning. If you Google Learning is Earning, it's from Institute of the Future and it lays out exactly how this will all run on blockchain. So this debt is going to be securitized so just like they were securitizing the mortgages that we talked about in the last show, they're going to securitize the debt for income sharing agreements. And they're using this platform called Edly. And Edly was developed by a man by the name of Christopher Riccardi. And Christopher Riccardi is known as the grandfather of collateralized debt obligations. Hmm. So he, he was essentially the creator of the tool that sank the last global economy. So Riccardi is also now involved in securitizing not, you know, was, was mortgage debt, this time out it's training debt. And so they're in the process of creating all of this training debt. And the investors in this, this is the Lumina Foundation, which was created after the sale of Sally May. Okay. And so the Lumina is very much present in, it, it's based in Indianapolis, but it's very heavily involved in the shift to competency, mastery, proficiency-based education that's running through New England. And this idea that you would have a credential, that the, the credential is no longer that you have a high school diploma or a GED or an associate's degree or a, or a four-year college or a graduate degree or a PhD or something. It's any badge that unlocks the chance for you to compete for work. And so all of the credentials, their goal is that there will be no grades, no age-based grade, no age-based cohorts of children in like second grade. 
It will just be, you are a free agent in the Pokemon Go augmented reality world, collecting skills, doing points, using wearable technology in a global police state. It all goes into the credential record store. And, you know, we're seeing the falling apart of even many of the state educational systems, like the state of California education system, it's, it's totally falling apart. And I don't know how long it will last because the model they want is just continual skill chasing with these income sharing agreements. Now, and this, could, again, this is all backed by skillful. Yes, if I could say something about that. Um, I do know that just in my lifetime, my contemporaries that are working in, you know, I grew up, uh, you know, I was born in the seventies. So I was during the dot-com bubble you know, a lot of my friends were doing coding. A lot of them ended up working for defense contractors because that's basically the only work there was around. So they're doing coding for defense contracting. They're going, gosh, should I go back to get my master's? Maybe I'd make more money because they see the younger kids coming up making about the same amount of money as them. But then they realize, a couple of them realize it's not about education, not like the letters after your name. It's about these certificates. Like you've been through certain training that makes- micro credentials. Yeah, your credentials, those things. Even that are micro, because like now it's not even having a full credential. It's like a micro certificate. Yes. Because the capitalist imperative is to break everything smaller and smaller and smaller because at each breaking point is the, someone's pulling profit out. Yes, exactly. So that when you said that about the starting kids like in elementary school to get these credentials, I'm like, yeah, sure. Why not? I, I've already seen this starting to happen with people my age. It's not about the actual education. It's about credentials. And I will say, so as a parent, when I was navigating the, the public school system here, and I, you know, I, I'm late to the game, I admit, like, the, the 2013 was the shock to my system to really have me look in to see what was happening and to question the larger systems. Yeah. And my child spent much of their time in a magnet school. Yeah. So this man, it was underfunded, definitely, but they you know, I didn't realize it till probably like the last year or two of our time there because it went middle through high school. But I'm like, oh, you guys are training, training the overlords. You know, like it was many of the, the, the professors from Penn had their children in the school. And, and I kept saying, well, how do we leverage the social capital of the school to help, you know, advocate for other schools that are being targeted? And no one was ever really particularly interested because like this was going to be the school of the overlord kids. And, but they got to read books. I mean, they didn't have, the, the school was falling apart and the teachers were underpaid and they didn't have any extra, you know, limited extracurriculars, but they had books and they weren't oppressed by the technology. And, and that wasn't the case in a lot of, in a lot of the other schools. So, you know, when I started to, to, to look at how this was laying out, it's just, it's, it is, it's a global system. And we actually have to be able to look at the whole thing because I was just nibbling off bits and pieces until I, I saw the broad sweep. And then you'll see here with Skillful, you'll see like LinkedIn and Microsoft mm -hmm. and, and that, that LinkedIn is part of this state playbook, right? These folks have playbooks. This, none of this is happening just by accident. They have the state play, playbook for skills-based labor markets. And I just put out on my Facebook today, I said, you know, humane education of children must happen outside the reach of the labor economists, because we are currently living in a moment where the global economy is not working for most people. Even people who on paper uh, look like they're succeeding, have debt, have precarity, have stress. It is not an economy of abundance and care. It is an economy of austerity and competition and uncertainty. Yes. And so are we, are we really going to let these companies feed our kids into this labor market that is broken? Or do we need to reimagine what it means to be an educated, participating human being in the world rather than just chasing the next credential? And so LinkedIn is a big part of this because Microsoft bought LinkedIn. LinkedIn, I, I very strongly feel that this will be linked to these credentials, the badging, the badging programs. Uh, LinkedIn is tied to this youth workforce development programs that are being rolled out in our city, have been for quite some time in partnership with IBM. So they, they do youth summer jobs, but they get the kids plugged into LinkedIn early on. And it's not on this map, but you know, Microsoft also bought Minecraft. 
and they're pushing Minecraft education. And so that's the virtual world building, right? Mm -hmm. You live and you play with your friends in the virtual world and you buy virtual items and you earn virtual things. And it's not about real nature. It's not about a mud puddle. It's about a block. It's Here's a, block. a soil <laughs> block. You can pick <laughs> these 10 kinds of soil and put it in a block, right? But it's not a mud pie. It's not a, a, a stream. It's not organic material. It is Microsoft's fake version of the world that they're interested in pushing people into and getting kids trained up to in a very baseline level code the digital prison, yeah. which, you know, as we were talking about feeding children into industry, yeah. you know, the, the children of the farm fields, when that became industrial agriculture, they moved to the factories and then they moved to the call centers. Well, the next job of this next civilization is not to build railroads or skyscrapers or highways or housing, it's to build the global digital jail and it has to be coded. And so right now our entire education system is being harnessed into coding the, this global virtual reality prison, but it's being sold to us as something progressive and innovative and that we have to be sure to you know, close the digital divide or else some people might not be captured in the digital jail. I mean, they're not gonna tell you that part. All right, Allison, I, here's my yeah. thing. First off, two points. First off here in Rhode Island, under Gina Romando, Governor Gina Romando, we have a new like welfare to work type, type of program. It's actually, and they're touting it. It's our artificial intelligence program that will find you a new job. Oh, so wow. It's, yeah, it's okay. already here. The other thing too, is that this, do you think, I guess I'm trying to ask, it's a global thing. Do you think this whole race to 5G was just a sham? Personally, I do. I think it was just set up to be like a, oh, we've got to beat China. I think it's, well, I, here's, I want to hear from you, but I think it's all about, because everywhere during this whole COVID shutdown, because I'm talking to people in Europe, everybody's saying, yeah, the Verizon trucks are the different tele. tele comms trucks are out and we're not allowed out of our house and they can see them out their windows. It seems to me that this whole process, they're doing this all over the world. So it's not yeah. just like a race for us as a nation, it's a race for the whole world. It's a race for the world, right? I mean, and that's why with, you know, I encourage people if you haven't seen the World Economic Forum, the Great Reset, I mean, they lay it out and it's being framed as we have to reimagine what life on the planet looks like because of the environmental degradation, which on the one hand, yes, it's true. I am not in any way denying the, the great harm that, that consumer culture and this technological culture has done to the planet and particularly the global North to the global South, like that is all real, but it's being used as a pretense to double down on all of the worst aspects that they will create impact markets in by putting a sensor on everything on the planet to track it to compliance, into compliance. And it is a, it is a technocratic, it's a, an industrialized uh, fascist really program that's going to further concentrate wealth and power in the hands of the people who are controlling the AI and the cloud. And it is global. So, it, so what they needed to enact this new version of the world, which is really a virtualized version of the world using military technology, simulation technology was a global scenario, right? So the public health presents this global scenario and now ongoing because they've already been, made it very clear about their anticipation of future pandemics, which, you know, whether they're natural or man-made, clearly our government has very sophisticated biowarfare weapons, use of nanotechnologies and these other technology systems that we are in asymmetrical warfare right now, yeah. I believe of these yeah. billionaires against humanity on the planet of which it's embedded in nation states, but the, their goal is to, to, if you look at Estonia, is to eliminate nation states out of existence and create this globalized system. And I will say for me, you know, it's, it's hard navigating this because you have to be very nuanced in how you talk about it. There, you can't speak about it in broad, broad brush strokes. I am not a nationalist. Like I, I feel very much that the trajectory of where we're at now is built on a history of enslavement and a history of indigenous genocide. And that many of the terrible things that we will be seeing carried out on against the poor and the working poor and breaking up families and putting them into controlled environments is based on the residential schools 
um, and what we did to, to Native Americans. And, and Pennsylvania is the home of Carlisle Residential School, which was the model for much of that. So we need to know that history to, to know, like, I don't feel super confident in the Constitution's ability to protect us from all of that because it certainly never protected people who were considered disposable in other eras. And now we're all disposable. So that that is my standing. That said, I think I don't dismiss the concern over globalization. And I really wish that the left would be more on board with what's happening with telepresence labor in this panopticon, in this military panopticon. And that I feel that the answer is both to cherish our cultural practice of individual geographies, but then have global solidarity against the AI system, right? Because this is rolling out in, they're blockchaining children in Boa Vista, Brazil, right? Like we know that Gaza is a test bed of many of these technologies. We know that Heckman is in China and they're doing facial recognition software on families in China. So how do we stand in solidarity with the families of the world, knowing that much of this infrastructure actually originated out of the United States, out of innovative finance and out of Silicon Valley and out of the Boston venture capital military zone, right? That, that it's our responsibility to bear that and to, to come at that from a place of like love for the world and humanity, because I think that's, if we are in an energetic system, and I know this may sound flaky, but the more I look into this, it signals intelligence, it's electrical engineering, and it's happening on levels of physics that we don't fully understand. And that I do believe that people in working in the space of electrical engineering and, and other forms of physics may have information that we don't have. And even as we know at the nano level, the laws of physics don't apply in the same way. That's how they're manipulating things at the nanoscale because the, the laws of physics as we currently know them are different. Yes. And so anyway, that's probably a long story short, but I think it is global. I think we need to have global solidarity at, while at the same time appreciating what makes us us and recognizing that the flaws that are baked in that we actually, this is moment of reckoning and potential redemption. Yeah, I love that. <laughs> that was a great statement. I love that. Okay, now we're still looking at this. But 5G is program. part of it. I yeah. mean, I have 5G at either end of my block. You would not believe in Philadelphia, I live about five blocks from the Ben Franklin Parkway, which is the art museum in the Rocky Steps. Mm -hmm. And it's where the Pope actually came a while ago. Wow. So there's these interesting sort of potential ritually things happening. And the amount of 5G, you would not imagine the infrastructure, the crazy installations that are here. But it's beyond 5G because the robot to robot communication and the digital twinning that's coming that actually just Dassault, I think, which it has a base in Rhode Island is, is advancing under the guise of having a healthcare digital twin. That's 6G, that's 6G. And then someone else yesterday just told me about seven. So- Oh, great, 7G, wonderful, great. Yeah. So yeah, it is, they need, the 5G and ultimately the 6 and what, whatever comes beyond that yeah. to run the internet of bodies. Yeah, See, I, yeah aware of the internet, I am aware of the internet of bodies and the nano, the internet the of- The internet of bio nano things, yeah. yeah. That's, that's I think so, what this is really all about. Yeah, and so this is just part of that. It's interesting that you, so you told me that the workforce, the welfare to work is running on an AI system to do job placement. Yeah, they just announced this very recently. I wanna say like two months ago that this okay. is like a new thing, very proud of it. Well, I would like to get that in. So, you know, we, we spoke about it a little bit last time about these human capital bonds yes. and they're based on a cost offset that, that people are projected not as, you know, creative assets for your community, but as debt burdens, because that's how global finance and the military technology needs to view people as a, a potential. What's your debt burden so I can gamble on your life? And all of this is, is hinging on digital identity. They sometimes call it self-sovereign identity. Um, my guess is the goal is to get this all on blockchain and is to have an interoperable data profile of each person that will feed into this digital twinning program. So Rhode Island, has has a data hub that is connected to that is going to enable like create the groundwork for the interoperable data systems and so you can see it's connecting into the education system the health system post-secondary education um, department of children youth and families and the labor department so all of these are feeding into the data hub which is what will run the pay for success programs and it's important to know that pay for success has sort of been baked in. You see here, there's a, a pay for performance pilot 
with higher education. There's this outcomes-based welfare reform. There you go. I'm sure that the job program is baked into that for managing children and families. And I will say, this is a piece of this that's really important to understand, especially in the context of, as I mentioned, enslavement and the reservation system and the boarding school system for indigenous people, is that you can control a population by threatening their children. Yes. If you control people's children, it's, it's much easier to control families if you threaten them with taking their children away. And so in many respects, the welfare departments, they're being remade to serve global finance. And in an optimal world, you would have social workers and social welfare systems whose goal would be the well-being of those in their charge. That their goal would be to re help remake the world so they wouldn't need to even have a job as a social worker, right? So that the, the need for social workers in an optimal, that we wouldn't need them because the world would be okay, or mostly okay, we would need few of them. But in the world that we have now is they are agents of the state and they will be tasked with running the impact deals and collecting the data. Not that they wanna do that. Most people who go into caring professions, whether that be education or healthcare or social work, they do it because they care about people. Right? And they're told this is how you can care about people is to do this job. So this job is being weaponized against families. And this will be like the overseers um, on the plantation of the data plantation. And so the welfare to work, you know, to, and they will be verticals. They will be managed for improving their impact through in all of those spaces, the, the, the healthcare educators, social workers, they will be reskilled for micro credentials also as impact investments. And so we need to actually figure out how to organize all of these people, not to blame them, but even though I'm really frustrated with the teachers at this moment, but like not to outright blame them, but to enable them with this information to say, we don't want your job to be this. We don't wanna turn your job into being a soft policeman for global finance. We have to organize together to refuse it. And all of these systems you can see is are coming out of Harvard Government Performance Lab. So they are the ones providing the technical assistance and remaking education in service of the, the competency model, the badge model, using technology to collect and aggregate the data for the global reskilling program that you will never get off the pathways. Okay, here's, here's a question. Yeah. What if moving forward, there really are no jobs other than working for this pathway? Like, well, I'm trying to make that not happen. I know. I, know. <laughs> I mean, I can't imagine I'm doing this today. People are like, thank you so much. They, and I'm like, listen, I don't want to live in the world they're building. If the world they're building are here, um, there, there is no work for you because you didn't meet the grade to be the data analyst and work for Michael Bloomberg and run the what works world. Um, here, sit in this, uh, a freight container, repurposed freight container, tiny house with your smart TV and a virtual reality headset and maybe a bicycle on the other end so that you can maintain your health and through your piezoelectric human energy harvest, run the blockchain and yeah. show your impact and pretend you can go on a vacation in a, in a virtual reality video game and compete against other people for on the leaderboard and, and, then, and then have to do you know, in, have your regular injections of nanotechnology to keep you, you know, passive in the face of all of this, that's hell. Yeah, yeah. I don't want that. No, and you, and, yeah. and I, I don't I imagine see. most of the people listening to the show don't want this. And this is brand new information that you just right. laid out. And like I said, Rhode Island, you said it too, is very small. We're a little Petri dish. And look at this. Can you zoom out so we can look at the Petri dish, the whole Petri dish? Look at this thing. I mean, this is just a tiny one. I have a bunch of other maps. Oh, I bet you do. All right. So anyhow, and if people want to jump out of the Petri dish, should, should they be homeschooling their kids? What should we do? Well, I mean, at this point, we need to educate each other yeah. about this because this model is a horror show. I mean, it is, a, it is, and this is not just Rhode Island, but again, they nibble off little chunks and then they, they try things out and they see what works. You'll hear that evidence-based, what works, social impact. These are all the buzzwords. Right. And for the most part, 
again, this is fully bipartisan, but it needs to run through the social welfare system, which admittedly is, has always not worked well for most people and is now being further weaponized, but they need the system of government to capture people essentially. And what I keep saying is like, wake up at this point now, Google, Google and Goldman Sachs are your government. <laughs> you know, it's, it is no, the, who, these, the governments are accountable to finance, defense, and um, tech, you know, that's who is running the government and, and they're doing it as data. And they're saying that we're doing it because it's, it's innovation and it's progress. And that's why for me, I feel very strongly that we need to look to the history and look to other models, right? Look to the earth, look to natural systems because this is unnatural. It's about channeling our life into an unnatural system. And, you know, I, I have friends who are on the ground in India and looking at what's happening with the farmers protests around the farm policies because managing access to all the basics, including food, and they wanna re-engineer food to make essentially GMO humans. So those people are taking that stand and they may not know exactly the nature of every detail of this you know, spaghetti soup that we're in, that we're being trapped in this web, but they know it's a web. And many of the people in India right now who are standing against their government, Modi, who's an operative for uh, this fake wrong kind of green and for Bill Gates and for digital identity systems and Aadhaar and digital currency, they are making that principled stance from a very spiritual place on the land, on yeah. the land. Yeah. And, and the stuff that's happening to us like when we're being trapped in these AI data-driven systems, it won't stop with humanity. It's going to be all living beings on the planet. I mean, these folks are crazy enough to actually be mapping down to your microbiome. You know, like a whole bunch of our bodies isn't even our body. It's these tiny little creatures. And these people want it all. Like they are, they are, have a mind virus and they want to control everything in the world. Heckman is mapping the microbiome for health, but they want to claim all of life. And so- you know, this is the moment, like, I, I, I don't think any of us asked to be born at this moment in time that seems so transformative, right? That it's like, well, speak now or forever, like agree to be a synthetic human being. And that all of the unborn will also be synthetic human beings that may not be in control of our, our own agency, because we're, we're resonating with five and six G, which is this military construct. Um, it's time to speak up and it sounds impossible, but that's why I make these maps and say, look for yourself. I would love to be wrong. I would love for someone to say, um, oh, you missed this spot over here. This is why it's not happening. And my husband's like, it probably won't all happen. And I'm like, well, but those of us who know it have to speak up because if we're not speaking up, how do you live with yourself? Exactly. Right. Exactly. I mean, how do you live with yourself if you don't speak up and question? And again, maybe there's, 85% of the world who thinks skills badging in indentured servitude and living in a freight container and virtual reality headset is fine because, you know, that's the only thing they can imagine. And I don't like that. But if the conversation were even had, then I would at least agree that there was some consensus. But this is not informed consent. Exactly. People do not know. And the people who are being targeted are the poor and the dispossessed. And so those of us who are in a position of having the privilege to speak out a, a who have the time and space to do the mapping need to stand for them. And then also listen to them about navigating it because the, there are a lot of people who've been navigating oppressive, oppressive situ situations in the U S government for a long time. And, and, and that is a skill. I can't claim that skill. I have a lot to learn in that area. Oh my gosh. Okay. So this, once again, I'm just, I'm thrilled that we're even having this conversation. This is, is outstanding. All right. Let, this little thing that we're looking at, little sis, is that you? Did you put that together or is it a different um, thing? No, I mean, they keep kicking me out. They do. <laughs> it's, Why? it's funded by all the people who are doing impact investing. <laughs> <laughs> this reminds me a little bit of, are you familiar with Muckety? Um, yeah, I've, 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 seen, I've seen. They're see, out of business. See, the thing is, like, I will, I will say, so if you click on this, so it opens this data, right? And yeah, so this yeah. is all, and I pretty much have entered all of this data myself over the last four years, right? Oh. And, and so these are all things I have for Rhode Island. And, and so if I walk away from this, the system, then it's kind of like I'm leaving part of my brain, yeah. um, you know, out, out there. And so that's, 
you know, that's why I use it, even though it's problematic. And I encourage if other people use it, that they do it with this understanding that actually a, a few months ago, they, they kicked me out and deleted all of my 350 maps. But you did have them all backed up. Correct? I, well, I, I made all of these maps from, I mean, they're not all great maps. Like it's a learning curve. It took me a long time to learn how to make these maps. Um, but they eventually restored them because there was really serious, um, angry correspondence with people. So they restored them and then they, they kept trying to keep, still keep me out. So, um, you know, it's, it's a, pro I won't say it's not a, a a thing without its own problems. Initially, I just thought that they have actually research groups in various cities, but they're only researching certain things and they're researching mostly electoral politics. And, you know, if you actually, you know, maybe I can, I can look on, just pull up one more map. Oh, I started, I wanted to start on big picture learning. Um, you know, it's, it's global, but what we have underway and th so this is the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development, right? So that's, you know, this is, this is a global program and you can see this is an older map that I made, but Jim Heckman is over here. So he's the one we talked about the last time with the, the Heckman equation funded by Pritzker and Soros that's tracking uh, social emotional skills. And look, you know, he has these papers like the economics and psychology of personality. And what they're working on really, and you see that this social impact investment initiative, the long longitudinal study of skill dynamics, mm -hmm. they're looking at personality and really behavioral management for a, an inhuman future. You know, when I was, when my child was in school, they were talking a lot about grit. Heckman works with Angela Duckworth, who I don't know if Angela's in this, this map, um, but she was working, he was working with Angela Duckworth on grit and character and engineering character through digital video games. Because if you can imagine knowing all of this and trying to ma manage your mental health is not easy, right? Like if you actually understood that the end goal, not that they'll necessarily be able to accomplish it, but their end goal is transhumanism where according to the Japan Science and Technology Agency program that their moonshot program that by 2050, we will no longer be burdened with a physical mind and body in time and space, that we will just exist as some sort of digital thought cloud. That's a lot to hold, right? Yeah. And so right now I feel like they're triaging the, especially the young children and especially getting into families through the home visit programs and through pre-K programs to start triaging like who are going to be the people with the grit or the resilience, the mental strength to the, both the mental strength and the conformity to be managed to run these systems? Because they do need a thin veneer of data analysts to run the blockchain, to manage it. You know, there's not going to be another Snowden. There's not going to be a plucky libertarian homeschool kid that's going to get into the NSA and expose it, even though, you know, it's disappointing because he just wants a better NSA. But like, they're going to make sure that thing doesn't happen again. And they're going to do that based on tracking and digitally programming uh, people's behaviors from the very earliest ages, if they're by this 2035, 2050 time horizon going to move towards virtual humans, like avatar humans. And, and I will just say, it's, I mentioned in the last talk, the Global Education Futures Initiative with Pavel Leksha, the transhumanist. So he's over here. There's a paper in this called NeuroWeb that's talking about transhumanism and education, this transhuman visions. And that uh, Tom Vander Ark was, is the Gates guy. He, he's the guy, he's with Learn Capital now and in, in, in investing in a lot of education ventures. Okay. Yeah. So in big picture, so this is the other bit. So well, maybe I, I would like to come back and actually have a, a no, no, session we, we on big will. picture. Yeah, we'll have a, we will come back. Uh, we yeah, have, but big picture uh, learning is, is connected to all of this and it's being framed as this sort of integrated progressive model. But once you wait, layer in wearable technology and digital badging and a, a really inhuman workforce development program, big picture takes on much more sinister overtones. Okay, all right. We do have about... 15 minutes, if you, 20 okay. minutes, 15, if you want to jump into that, you could, or not. Um, okay, well, let me see. I'll, I'll, I'll talk a little bit about big picture. Uh -huh. Let me see. So um, I'll just pull up one other map. I'm so, my eyes start to twitch. I'm starting to get the twitch in the eye. This is amazing. And my eye is twitching too. This is, <laughs> this is a map. I actually, so my friend Jason, he has a, a YouTube channel. I have a YouTube channel under my name, Allison McDowell YouTube. It's really boring. It started when I was just needed to put a few, my, my 
you know, when I was doing testimony at the school district to have a place to store it so I could put it in my blogs. But now it actually has a playlist with many other interviews, including a recent one I did going through this map with my friend Jason, who has a, a, his own YouTube channel called Argus Fest. But it was about Salesforce and Oracle, which is, again, part of this larger, the COVID vaccine or the vaccine credential program. Because you're not just going to have Oracles into everything, I swear to God. Regular credentials, right? Like, here's your credential that you can do this skill. Your credentials are also going to include things like your health status. So that's where it gets really scary. And when I was first doing this this work in education around big picture, which is connected to the Met in Rhode Island, it's connected to this business innovation district. It goes back to the early 1990s, as I said, there's this parallel of the education, restructuring education for a technological age. That big picture was framed as a progressive option. It was allied with the Annenberg Institute education reform, which was housed at Brown with Ted Sizer. And, you know, it was all about, you know, progressive project-based learning models. And kids would follow their passion and, you know, uh, several days a week, they would be out of school doing out of school time learning in workplace settings. So this is a high school predominantly. Right. So in, I think it was maybe 2016, big picture learning, which had one school in Philadelphia, our school district, which is poor, poor, like gave them $26 million, which is crazy amount of money. And of these 23 schools that were closed, one of them was Vox middle school. And they gave Vox Middle School, which is was actually in pretty decent shape, too big picture as their sort of test bed. And then in big picture used the building and it houses not only their education program, but also all sorts of other social welfare, social work programs around like financial literacy and healthcare. And you can see the wraparound services being embedded into this education space around big picture at Vox. Now, I will say Big Picture is a franchise now. It's in many states and at least three different countries. And I was in touch with someone several years ago who is a a high school teacher in London who told me that the first social impact bond in the United Kingdom, and actually the United Kingdom really catalyzed the creation of social impact bonds. They they, they started in the, the Minneapolis area with Rolnick, but then later Sir Ronald Cohen with social finance He was a Harvard MBA and the father of British venture capital. He leveraged lottery money in the UK and unclaimed banking accounts to create the social impact bond market in the United Kingdom. And it was very successful because they had a better social safety net. So it went in through the NHS, it went in through the social systems. But the first education social impact bond in the UK was actually in partnership with Big Picture Learning. So there's a very direct connection between big picture and the social impact partnership space. And when I was doing the working on big picture, I I came across something called Emblaze. And Emblaze was an app for the workplace learning program. Now you can imagine if you're gonna defund schools and starve schools that this idea of a work-based model is attractive because you can say, oh, well, maybe we can piggyback, right? It's kind of like COVID. We can have an AB cohort. We can use the same school and have half the kids go one half of the week and the other half of the kids go the other half of the week because they're out doing their work-based learning the other time and earning their badges. And so we can data mine them for their soft skills and their compliance and their mobility. But even with a work-based learning program, you would think you would not use an app. Right? Wouldn't you have a counselor who would have vetted programs? I mean, in Philadelphia, I couldn't even get into the schools unless you had an FBI background clearance to just volunteer with kids reading in the classroom. But you're going to send kids out into just random workplaces. Like, and even if some of the people have clearances, not everyone, you're not going to have everyone in a whole company undergo an FBI background check. So you're just sending kids out into this world to earn the badges. And in Blaze was the app that was going to not only give them suggestions of of, 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 you know, apprenticeships or internships, which it's not like ordering, you know, should I order Chinese or pizza for lunch? It's your work-based learning where you're going to spend half of your week. Um, It isn't just a toss off thing, but it was actually going to track their compliance. Like, did they show up on time? They can track their behaviors. And I think ultimately would probably be tied in with a digital currency system. And this model was developed by Salesforce, Mark Benioff being a protege of Larry Ellison of Oracle. And Salesforce is running, is funding Social Suite over here, which is one of the dashboards that's going to track compliance for social impact welfare services. 
So it's, it's, it's both big picture is this very old pseudo progressive model, but it's being fed into the pay for success market. It's being paid into tracking human capital on app, app markets. And then there's a big picture learning that's in Australia, in New South Wales. And, and the larger construct is that New South Wales, the New South Wales government is doing, they're one of the, the, ten, the 10 digital nations, Australia is one of the 10 digital nations. They're doing digital driver's licenses and also doing digital welfare. And with the Commonwealth Bank of Australia, they are pursuing social impact bonds on blockchain, blockchain bonds. Mm -hmm. And so before the pandemic hit, I had this feeling in my gut that the first blockchain social impact bond was going to be in Australia and it was going to be with big picture. And so I think the education space with blockchain social impact has taken a bit of a back burner and they're waiting because once they get the health transcripts, the, the health credential program, the vaccine passes for monitoring people, they can get everyone hooked onto a digital identity to get the interoperable data system. And then once they're sort of trapped in that, they can start layering on things like the education savings accounts and the digital vouchers for education. And then that's when the big picture learning, this learning in a, an augmented reality, internet of bodies, stackable credentials so that hedge funds can gamble on your future program really is going to take off. And it's taking off in alignment with the UN Sustainable Development Goal 4 and UNESCO. Okay. UNESCO. Mm -hmm. So Why UNESCO, you UNESCO mobile learning. People? Why don't you tell people what UNESCO is? So, I mean, UNESCO, if, let, me, let me see if I can click on this if it will open up. Oh. My poor computer is really struggling these days. I'm looking so, at because you got open. Oh, they have the, the the data portal. Well, so so it so UNESCO is it's a division of the United Nations. Yep. They're coordinating a lot of the education data in conjunction with the World Bank and the IMF. So when we're yep. talking about globalization, I keep being like, where are the leftists on on the um, you know, on on what's happening with ed tech and with globalization. Um, they're, yeah, United Nations Educational, Scientific, and Cultural Organization. So they're a child organization of the UN. And you can see here that they're part of sustainable development. They're pursuing blockchain. They're uh, pursuing virtual reality education. You can see that they're doing a Euro Pass digital diploma and, you know, coordinating with the EU. They're connected with Microsoft on a digital divide partnership. They're connected with Sabre, which is the World Bank data collection system. And so they're just, it is a global program. And I think that that was my frustration with many people who are still working at this from the standpoint of, of electoral politics, right? Nobody, nobody voted in Davos, nobody voted in UNESCO, nobody voted in the World Bank. And yet these entities working on behalf of these outside interests are dictating how we can learn in the world, how we can move in the world, how we can be human in the world. And, and we, we, we don't, we are not going to be able to change that from within the system of voting per se. Yeah, It's very frustrating and hard, but that's the reality. And until people get a picture of these larger map systems, you, you might be misled and think that, you know, you do, you know, and that's why I keep saying, like, I think that this is a spiritual engagement program because it's big and any one of the people working for any one of these dots doesn't know they're in the web. I mean, they may have an inkling, but what is their motivation to dig in and know it? Because once you know it and you start to unpack it, then you become complicit, then you have to do something. Yeah. And I dug in and now, now I feel like I have to do something, which oh, is Allison. Oh my gosh. <laughs> I love you. I just want to say, I love you. I love you so much. Just know that. Now, listen, once again, we're about 10 minutes out and um, we are going to come back and talk to you regardless, because you've got so much knowledge. Um, let's, was, was there something? Yeah, I want to do a really a dig in to, to Rhode Island. I mean, do, do you have a thought in terms of, you know, the badging again, as both military defense tracking i mean to me i had no idea that rhode island had so many defense contracting institutions oh yes we've got everything we literally have everything yeah and and the, the other piece about new england that i find really interesting is if you know i frame this as digital slavery um and i mean actually slavery with an understanding of how the north 
enacted and enabled enslavement in the South, you know, the, the, the actual enslavement of African people, because all of that ran, that was enabled through the financial operations of, uh, you know, financial institutions in New York City, but mm-hmm. even New England had this long history with slavery. I mean, Brown University has has sort of had its own say about, you know, the, the slave trade in Rhode Island. Absolutely. And so, so there's the slavery and the maritime trade because many of the bets that are going to be placed on people as human capital are coming out of hedge funds, but it's also insurance companies. Yes. And these insurance companies yes. are built on maritime right. trading, which right. is what right. New England was built on. You yeah. know, and so Connecticut is lousy with insurance companies, you know, the Hartford, all of these things, these insurance companies are risk management and the risk management is baked into the signals intelligence, which is being fed by the internet of bodies, whether yeah. it's the internet of bodies coming out of the education system, whether it's the internet of bodies coming out of preventative healthcare system, whether it's the internet of bodies based on what you're eating in your food system or what, where you're living in your house system. We are, we are creating this vast cloud of data analytics to, pr- to feed the impact markets, but it's, it's, it's connected to the insurance companies and the, the slave trade. And now instead of the ocean, it's the cloud. Yes, yes. I did want to mention in Hartford uh, back in, I want to say the 60s, you know, the um, company that has the umbrella, the insurance company that has the umbrella, a red umbrella yeah. for a logo. Um, that was the company that actually had a CIA front, like division, doing geoengineering. Wow. They were, they were they, it was people like um, Kurt Vonnegut's brother is, was a geoengineer. Yeah, really? and they obviously they're trying to put out these, you know, policies, they're selling policies for insurance and they were trying to control the weather. Oh, wow. Well, and then, you know, now we see with water futures, right? Yeah. I mean, well, look and- at Enron. Enron was the first one to put out the um, derivatives for the weather. Everybody's like, what the hell? You know, if you watch that movie, um, The Smartest Guys in the Room, I think it's called, about Enron. There, oh, I need to There's a clip. Well, Michael- there. Enron was Michael Milken, right? Yeah. There's a clip in there of them announcing that they're going to be these weather derivatives and there's people in the audience are just like what what are you even talking about but they were the first to do that and you know at such a large scale and of course Enron collapsed yeah well the thing about Enron though is it is isn't it Milken Michael Milken was he Enron or was that oh junk bonds no that was different it's it's sorry it wasn't so Enron Enron wasn't John Arnold though was it I don't know Okay, I'll have to look it up. Maybe yeah. we can edit that part but out. Nonetheless, so I thought this, the whole thing with, and you said the slave thing here in Rhode Island, once again, going back where I live, actually where I live on this point, um, I live on the water. Um, it, the Narragansett tribe here in Rhode Island was the central bank of the early, the Brown family and everybody else came and they bought wampum from the the Narragansett tribe, wampum wow. is made out of quahogs that you can only really find in Rhode Island because they got this pretty little shell that's got purple in it. Yeah. And, yeah. And they came and bought the wampum from the Narragansetts. The Narragansetts crossed from a very wealthy tribe. Um, now they have a ca- nice casino. No, they don't have a casino, but the other tribes down here have casinos. Um, but they were the first kind of Ponzi scheme you know, well, it goes back and it's this abstraction, right, of, yeah. of money and finance and natural wealth. And, you know, for me, again, it's, it's, it's a global system. We have a responsibility because a lot of this has been coming out of the United States. It's an imperial project. It's a project of empire. It's a project that's, you know, I will say increasingly, and I don't know how this, maybe you can think on it before we talk next time, but many of the, the entities offering social welfare services are tied up with faith-based institutions. Yes. So I've been going around trying to talk to people in a variety of faith practices to say like, hey, they're going to come knocking at your door and ask you to put children on blockchain or, you know, people who have addiction issues on blockchain. And that's not a, not a, if you are a person of faith, like think really long and hard before you do that, because it's the Catholic church is leading pay for success in Philadelphia. 
But again, going back to Israel, Ronald Cohen has Social Finance Israel, and I have a four-hour webinar on social finance in Israel and Tikkun Olam and impact investing in the Jewish community. Um, you know, the I, I just got back from Utah, and you know, the LDS Church has an incredible amount of assets, and they're partnered with the NAACP on this Finclusion Financial Literacy Program. So my sense is that, like in many of the ed tech companies, are based in the Greater Salt Lake region. So we really have to think about, you know, and, and I'm sure that there are people in any given classification, those who would seek to dominate other people and those who would seek to care and nurture people. And so what I, I feel like in this moment, what I'm trying to do is be a, to tell, to, to show the map, to tell what I see is happening and to try to be a conscience of, of this system because we are at this moment of reckoning and it's, it's a, hist a moment that's based in a very long history, uh, but we need to come together in a, and acknowledge it and move forward together. So it's somewhat unlikely allies. <laughs> and I'm not asking people to give up their principles about this, but to like look at things in a new way and say, we are at risk of losing future generations of children and humanity and our other sibling beings on the planet to nanotechnology. Which is, which is an agent of empire. And that is to me, the ultimate settler colonizer in, in, the, in the cosmos is AI. And so at this moment, we need to un move forward with that understanding and not let the fragmentation that has been happening across partisan lines against identity politics lines. We need to respect one another and come from a place of love and then figure this out because the, I, the stakes could not be higher. Hey, this is Allison. You just blew my mind all over the place. And I, I think it's really important that people understand this concept of social impact investing. And I'm so glad you came on the show to explain this to everybody. And I do hope people copy this video and share it. I, I'm kind of speechless. Thank you so much, Allison. We will be in touch with you again and you will be on the show again, I promise. We're going to talk more about this in the future. Everybody hang tight. We're going to make it through. We will. You'll see. Bye. See you next week. Citizen with Rachel L. McIntosh and Robo Cell. News and information.